Hi, I'm Josh Gonzalez, and welcome to Mind Meld. This is a podcast where I have in-depth conversations with some of the brightest people in the known universe. My aim here is to spark deep conversations around interesting topics so we can find the tools, tactics, and philosophies that we can all use in our daily and creative lives. In this episode, I sat down with Anthony Morgan to talk about his research on how to gain wisdom from a scientific perspective. He talks about how he perfectly blends his startup Science Everywhere with his research from his PhD in molecular science at Ryerson University. Science Everywhere's mission is to build social tools for better thinking, and his PhD is centered around how he can get scientific information out to the public so they can make wiser decisions. So basically, he takes these research questions and then actually executes on these through his company as he hosts these engaging live experiences called Freestyle Social, which is meant to foster creative thinking. Okay, so without further introduction, I just want to get into this conversation because in this episode, Anthony gives us some actionable tools and an actual scientific method that he's been studying to gain and build wisdom in our everyday lives. I'm Josh Gonzalez, and this is Mind Meld with Anthony Morgan. But yeah, that's awesome. What have you been up to? It's been interesting. It's been a really interesting time. I've been like, I'm a silver linings kind of guy. So I've been trying to find the bright side of all this insanity. Um, and I have found that I have um, learned to discipline myself way more than I ever have. Um, it's been really great. Um, because like, you're, if it's... If you don't have to show up at the office, nobody's going to like notice that you don't show up at the office or notice that you're not doing anything. So it's really all on you. And so I have found um, that like the first week of the pandemic, I was just like, oh man, like I, I fell apart. Like I'm an extrovert. I like being around people. That's where I get my energy. And so I didn't have that. And I was just not in a good place. And then the second week I was like, all right, let me try something new here. Started getting up every day, uh, 7.30. I'll like, start by cleaning the house a little, I'll uh, do some accounting, I'll write on my gratitude board, I'll uh, exercise, I'll meditate, and then I'm at my desk by like 9.30, writing out my, di- my schedule for the day. So it's been really awesome now. That's awesome that it totally worked out for you. Because I know before like, we were chatting, like we were both having this hard time uh, with scheduling and like trying to figure everything out because there's a lot going on, right? But then it's almost like you can cut out 90% of the noise and just focus on what's important. You're at home, like you can still chat with people and hopefully that carries through, right? And you can really just focus down and just hunker down. It's literally what it was all about. Totally, man. Like I really am just refining like what things don't I actually need in my schedule? What things actually add to my day and just like cut out all the noise. It's been, it's been really awesome, man. Dude, that's awesome. So what have you been working on lately? Uh, so, um, I mean, you know all about freestyle socials. I guess people listening might not, but um, uh, so I, I run that live event, Freestyle Socials. It's basically a live game of Would You Rather. Um, and it really is based around just getting a bunch of people, a bunch of perspectives together in a room to talk very closely and moistly near one another. And so, <laughs> um, obviously the government has recommended that I stop doing that and I have heeded those recommendations. Um, so we've had to pivot and figure out, well, is there a way to run these, um, online? And so that's what we've been working on, running an online version of Life Game with your at it. Dude, what was what was that um that transition like so i mean there's so many other platforms it's almost better i've been finding that like online events for conferences and stuff and and meetup groups have been actually better because like people are more likely to just kind of show up like oh i can be at home and i can just like turn on my computer and turn on my phone and join this instagram live and then you also get more people just like coming in it's like the new equivalent of like having the door open and people like walking down on the street like Instagram is like Main Street, you know, or think yeah. of like Queen yeah. Street West if you're in Toronto. And, you know, people are just like, they're just going by, walk by, oh, what's going on? What are they doing? What are they doing? And you just have your door open and people can just join. It's really cool. It's like, it's, it's so awesome. It's a really cool, cool way to do events. Yeah. Well, I mean, we found like, we found a bit of a mix because there is um, huge benefit and just like the, the number of people who this is available to now is, is expanded many fold like many orders of magnitude right like like you say anybody walking down instagram avenue can come through our doors um the challenge we've had is that some of the functionality that instagram supports isn't exactly analogous to like what we do in our live events so in the live events of freestyle social i guess people need to kind of know how it works so we'll show up at a bar we'll put take down the middle of the floor we'll ask i call them spark questions so things like would it be better if humans laid eggs or 
Elon Musk, super villain in waiting. Um, you, you answered that one. Oh yeah. Or, um, we asked, uh, I don't know, would you rather fight a tiger or a gorilla? Um, and then we'll tell our audience, look, you've got to pick a side. You've got 10 seconds to pick a side. And then we'll put a microphone in the middle of the floor and each half the room gets to explain to the other half why you should really come over to our side. Dude, that's awesome. And you can't really, you're saying that you can't really simulate that in Instagram? Yes and no. So there are three rules to the game. The first rule is just, you know, go up to the microphone and say your piece. So if you pick the side, um, share your idea, tell everybody why. Because it's, it's really about just getting a bank of perspectives as big as we can, right? We want to hear perspectives that we don't have. Um, rule number two is the one that's tougher to replicate. Um, so rule number two is suspend your judgment. If you hear an idea or a concept that surprises you, uh, you should suspend your judgment, change your mind, and physically walk across the line. Rule number three is change your mind again, so we really encourage people to you know, flip-flop. Um, in the live event, people can, no problem, walk across the line, and everybody can see everybody else walking across the line, which I think is an important part of the game. Yeah. Um, on Instagram, that gets a bit trickier. So. We can have people sort of cross the line back and forth by saying it in the comments, but that's really hard for everybody to see in Instagram in the same way yeah. that you could see it in a live event. And especially if you have lots of people. Exactly. I've been in live streams with like thousands of people and you type in like a letter and it's gone in a second. Like it's exactly. Just, it's exactly. The, gone, the stream has just washed it away. It just doesn't work um, with large... I mean, it's, it's really good for some things for large numbers of people, but for the specific thing that we're trying to do, like an important part of the fun of the game is getting to see all of your friends. Like you, You're like, should we pee in the shower? And your friend goes to the yes side and you're on the no side. And you're like, dude, what are you doing over there? Like being able to see that interaction is like half of the fun of the game. So we're, we're right now, we're trying to redesign that. We're, we're developing Freestyle Social into kind of a standalone app. Sort of. Really? Yeah. That's, is it going to use like video chat and everything? Like, yeah, that's the plan. We're, um, yeah, we're building a, a cl like a crash beta version of it that's designed to kind of ideally couple with Instagram if we can get it to so that it like helps people. It'll scrape the like comment section of Instagram and um, it'll like just read what people say, like left side or right side for whatever the question is. And then it'll make a visualization of that so that people can see it in real time on like the screen that I'm sharing with them. Um, if we can get it to couple with Instagram, that'll be really awesome because you know, that's where everybody is. But we also really are interested in the idea of having it be a standalone app that maybe, um, yeah, people would just hang out. Something like House Party, right? That people would yeah, totally have, you been using, have you been using House Party through this? I have been using House Party a little bit, yeah. Um, it's pretty interesting. It's, I mean, it's the closest thing that I've seen to what it feels like to be at a party in a digital space because you can kind of hop in and out of rooms at random and you can see who's in what, like that visualization part is important, right? Like you can see who's in other rooms. Like we're visual creatures, right? Like we need that. Like we are very, very, very visual. So any, I know for so. myself too, I'm even more visual probably than like the average person. Just, you know, I'm hyper creative with art and stuff. So I'm like, I, man, I need to be able to see, I need to be able to visualize what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really important and fun. We just, we like it. Like, so much of, I, I mean, you've probably had the experience where you're like texting your girlfriend and then um, you mean what you texted one way and she takes what you said a different way. And because she didn't have any of that visual feedback of like the playful, like twitching your lips or like the like expression on your face, she's like, I thought you meant it differently. We, we really need that visual feedback. To totally. To it's like, like, come on though. I put the upside down smiley face. You should know. I know yeah. <laughs> so yeah, man. And that's the thing, like, I mean, with your company too, you guys have obviously gone fully remote now. Have you seen the similar sort of things while working remote, like just using Slack or, or what, are, what are you guys using right now to communicate? Uh, yeah, we're using, um, we really like WhatsApp um, just because everybody's got their phone on them. And it's, it's, it's a space where people feel more relaxed. And that's kind of the culture that I try to uh, cultivate in my team is that like, we take our work seriously. And so we're all on it like all the time, but we are also, we're cracking jokes in there and posting memes to each other. Like, I feel like it's really important to have, um, especially right now when everybody's so stressed out and isolated, to have a space where we can be a bit sillier with each other. So we've, uh, we like WhatsApp and then we'll use things like Canva um, and uh, just, yeah, uh, Google documents and that kind of thing. So Yeah, I think having at least some kind of group chat is like key. And that's not even just with like the team, right? Like we use Slack. So I use Slack purely for like business because I like having the different channels. 
But then like, I want to have a WhatsApp group or like a messenger chat with my friends. Like, do you have that mindset to you? Like, Hey, this app has like this kind of conversation or like, yeah, I think people generally have that mindset, right? Like, I mean, so, okay. An example of this is we were trying to figure out where we should host our online freestyle socials. We were like, maybe we should do it on Instagram. Maybe we should do it on Facebook. Maybe we should do it on zoom. Yeah. Um, maybe we should do it in Google Hangouts. And, and we were reluctant to host it on zoom because for us, that felt like more of a professional space. Like most yeah. of our video conferences happen on Zoom. And so um, it's the difference between going to a library to party and going to a bar. Like one of them, you can, you can have fun in both, but people expect very different experiences in them. And that expectation carries through into the way they, like, they conduct themselves in that space. That so, is so true. That is absolutely true. Like just like the app icon and like knowing what is the context of that specific yeah. virtual space. And man, like that's going to obviously carry through into VR where like these virtual spaces become physical, like 3D spaces, yeah. not physical, but virtual 3D spaces. Yeah. Well, but that's the thing, right? Is it'll start to feel physical. Like your mind is really good at tricking you. Like in probably within the first minute of being in that space, your body just gets acclimatized to being like, all right, well, this is what the world is. Like your brain doesn't really care what the actual world is. It's just like, is this like, can I move in things in like ways that I can predict, predict in here? If yes, then yeah, this is the real world now. So it gets, it gets crazy when that gets flipped upside down. I don't know if you've ever done like psychedelics or something, but it's almost like the complete opposite of that. Cause your brain's like, Whoa, what is this? How do I interact yeah, with this? Yeah. But meanwhile, it's the same physical 3d space, but your mind is interpreting it. Completely exactly. Different. It makes different predictions about it. Um, I, uh, yeah, I haven't, uh, this is like the Elon Musk moment, I guess I'm supposed to talk about like all the, the weed I smoke and all the, like my, the psychedelics I do. You don't I have to, if you feel comfortable with it, man. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, I haven't tried, um, psychedelics, magic mushrooms. I am particularly interested in though. I am, I'm strongly considering it because I think it can provide you with some perspective that might be valuable, you know, like some insight, you know? Yep. It definitely um, does. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm very interested in it, but, um, I think that, yeah, that's like, those things can show you kind of something similar to what VR can show you, which is like a whole new world, no whole new way of just perceiving the world. Definitely. I mean, people are, I mean, people do say that, I mean, not just people, but some experts have been saying that like stuff like DMT, like the strongest of all psychedelics is yeah. basically a virtual reality because it completely hijacks your visual system, right? Yes. Your visual and auditory yeah. system. And that's what it is, man. Like it literally hijacks your yep. your input system and it's like hey this is it now which is that's why i think maybe people are kind of scared of it like there is definitely a little bit of a fear well, around it right yeah i mean they should be you should yeah. be afraid of it like you shouldn't treat it like a toy no it's, it's not, not a toy it's like a crazy crazy powerful thing that can like mess you up but it can also be a wonderful source of insight so i think that like and connection right yes exactly, exactly. yeah so like that's one of the things that happens um, really characteristically with like magic mushrooms is the, the dissolution of the sense of self. Like you get the sense that we're all connected. We're all one. And I think that like operating from that space is a really valuable space to operate. From. Like I wish more of the world operated from that space. Um, I think it would be a, a probably a better world if we could get there. Um, and so, yeah, I just think like from a neuroscience perspective, it's a really interesting phenomenon to think about. Cause like, I mean, that's my background. And a good way to think about the way that your brain operates is like a prediction machine. That's basically what it does is takes in a bunch of experiences, uh, finds patterns within those experiences, and it makes predictions based on that. Um, and so because you've, like, you've built up however many years you are alive of worth of experience, like it's got all that background to make predictions. And it's, re it's reinforced those predictions like every time. DMT is just like, all right, all the predictions you had, we're just going to throw them away. We're going to start from scratch. And you're just like, what the fuck? Like you're still trying to, you're trying to reinterpret the world as like, as though you've just been born. It's crazy. It's crazy. Dude, it's wild. That's why, honestly, if you haven't, I'm surprised you haven't tried at least like mushrooms. Yeah, I think, I know. I feel like 2020 is a year, man. Anyways, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to like force you to like, peer pressure. Why not? I just feel like, man, like just because the, like your mind, the way you operate, and just your background and and all the education you've done through like neuroscience and just all those inputs you already have in your brain you have a lot more to work with like people who i'm just gonna 
say what I'm thinking. People who are pretty dumb and just do magic mushrooms, they just get the visual effect. There's like, oh, this is cool. Like, look, everything's glowing yeah. and like, ha, ah, we're at a rave. But when you actually have like a lot of information in your brain that can make connections, what's going to happen with the mushrooms is it starts making new connections that were never formed. And sometimes if it's a really strong one, that becomes, that becomes a permanent connection. And dude, I just feel like someone like you, like the insights you would have, like you would need to have a video camera with you the whole time because the things that you would just, I mean, your phone, obviously, but I just feel like vlog style, just say what you're thinking. You would come up with some like crazy stuff. Like it really seems like a lot of the most important inventions were like in the last like 50 years were done on like LSD. And there was this whole thing where people in Silicon Valley, all those engineers, they were always microdosing LSD every day while they're working on their inventions, which is just insane to me. It's so well, I think it's, you would never think that that would that's how things get made, but it is. You know, one of the things that's um, really interesting to me about it. One of the reasons I'm really interested in, in it is um, because it relates to my PhD. Like right now, my PhD, I'm studying um, in parts. I'm trying to understand like what wisdom is, um, and then is, how do you like? Yeah, what is what is the program that you're doing right now? Remind me what the program is. Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, I'm studying wisdom in the molecular science program. It's a pretty cool like opportunity. It's really weird. Um, but so I'm in the molecular science PhD program at Ryerson University. Um, that program has like a sub a component to it that focuses on like science outreach and pedagogy, like teaching, that kind of thing. And so I'm in that kind of sub components of that degree. I'm trying to figure out how do you get um, people to care about in part like molecular science. So like curing cancer and that kind of thing, or, or like gene therapy. I'm trying to get people to care about it. Or actually COVID is a good example. Yeah. A lot of these things people kind of care about naturally. Um, but um, so I do that from the perspective of science communication. Um, and that's a field, just what it sounds like. It's just figuring out how do you get the public to, how do you get information to the public in such a way that they can make wiser decisions? And that's what Science Everywhere is. That's what your company also is. That's what we're trying to do, yeah. So we, that's we it's the perfect cross pollination. It's like you're taking the social media side of how people actually interact with you. You're doing real, I mean, you're getting so much data from that. And then you're taking it from a science perspective. This is a PhD program. And I feel like yeah. marrying those two, you can get real data and feed that into your, your studies. Well, that's exactly the plan. Yeah. Um, my PhD and my company, it's really hard for me to figure out where the line is. There probably should be one, but it's, I mean, right now, I know with science everywhere, we're trying to figure out how do we build social tools for better thinking and in some sense for wiser thinking. Um, and so we're taking the tools that science everywhere builds and we're studying them with my PhD to see, well, do they actually help people become wiser? Do they actually help people make better decisions? And what um, have you found so far on that? So far, I have found that COVID has changed the way we have to do this a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, so... We were originally planning on collecting data from people um, in the live event. We wanted to see their behavior. That's why that like, line crossing thing matters a lot. Um, we want to see how... We're using that to measure something called openness. Um, so in the wisdom research, openness seems to be a really important like, part of what it means to be wise. So our ability to identify the frame that we have to perceive the world um, our, willing, our willingness to break that frame to say, like, I'm going to tear it up and, and reform it in ways that are more predictive and then find better frames. That, that's, in a nutshell, you can think of that as openness and a really important part of wisdom. That's how we build wisdom, it seems like. I think that makes sense. You have to be open to receiving information, right? You literally exactly. have to open up that gasket. You got to let the information flow. Exactly. You know, makes sense. Otherwise, you can't be wise because you... They, nothing exists within your brain. We're taking it in from elsewhere, interpreting from our brain, and then you can be wise. You can bring it back out. It's just like, I would never think I'm wise unless I can understand the world better and what other people think. Not just so much like blindly thinking, but you have to be open to what they think and be like, hey, what Anthony said totally makes sense um, in context with what this guy said. I'm going to put these together and come up with my own answer. And that maybe is part of wisdom. That's exactly right. Um, I think you've actually, you've actually nutshelled it quite well. Like wisdom really is, it's, it's not a state you achieve, it's a process you engage in. And 
as long as you can keep yourself in that process, like then you're more likely to make wise decisions. Man, that is that is so good to hear because that is literally literally the premise of this podcast. That's all this is. That's awesome. I'm just like I want. I just want to have conversations with really smart people. Hence why you're on here. People who I can have these awesome conversations with. We can just literally mind meld. That's literally why it's just called yeah. mind meld, and yeah. we can just come up with ideas together because. You have all these things in your brain. I have all these things in the back of my brain. And when these come together, new connections are formed. 100%. That would never be done before. So then, then we can both listen back here. Other people out on the internet can listen back here. And then they can take the combination of both of our... Exactly. Power and then and interpret it themselves. And you're just... Build you know, more and more. Yeah, man. It's, that's it. It's just building knowledge. That's exactly right. Yep. I think that's really the core of wisdom. And I think that like the way that you're approaching it is... Um, I think it's spot on because... Like I, there's an expression that I, I use all the time. Um, we all have blind spots in our thinking that are by definition invisible to us. We don't know that they're there. So a really good way to find your blind spots is talking to people who see things differently than you. They're really good at that. And when you can do that, um, you can build more complete pictures of reality. And so the, the fact that you're basing your your podcast on just conversation, I think that really is constitutive of wisdom. I think it's really important to think of the build wisdom. So it's a really cool thing you're doing, man. Dude. Yeah. Thanks, man. I mean, I just kind of had, I, I love doing podcasts. You know, I did think tank before and we were supposed yep. to have you on and then yeah. it just ended abruptly. So we didn't have a chance to do that. So I'm glad that we had a chance to do this because yeah, man. man, like just for other people listening, we're both part of the transmedia zone. Both of our companies work at this incubator where we can, you know, work together collaboratively in this kind of open office situation. So the fact that you and I could like just be coming into work one day and then just cross each other, but go, oh, Hey, Anthony, what's yeah. up? Pick, both take our headphones off. Literally we're both <laughs> always wearing the same headphones. And yeah. then we just like, we just chat before the day and we can have this insanely cool conversation before we even start work. And our conversations usually have nothing to do with what we're working on, or it's, hey, I have this problem. Hey, I have this problem. Let's fucking exactly. talk it out. Yep. And then we can take different perspectives on it and like, yeah, problem solved, man. Totally, that's man. And, cool. that's, and that's kind of what I wanted to do with the podcast. So it's cool that we can kind of simulate that virtually. Like, luckily, we do have these tools and technology to be able to do this. And we have this magic window. This is literally like Star Trek. Like, you have a fucking, like, like a little portal into your... Yeah. It, you really... I think of it that way. It is like a portal across the world. You can... I mean, one of the things I've been wondering about is how or whether we'll go back to normal um, after this virus. Like, but what is normal? I, I, I've been thinking this. This is what I've been thinking. Like, what is, I don't think what we had been doing is normal. How is any of that normal? What is normal? Yeah. Normal compared to what? Like a caveman? They're like, what the fuck is that flying thing? You yeah. get in that? You get in that rocket? None of what we do is normal. Literally nothing. This yeah. is our new normal. All we have is new normals. Normal as in just what do we do every day? Well, for the last two months, our normal had been working online primarily, working from home. Get rid of that commute. Get rid of flying across the world and you know polluting the air with an airplane just to go to a conference when you could do it online. That's what I mean is like, I have at first, that first week I was really rocky working from home. And now like I... I it's just, it's the new normal for me. I'm very comfortable doing it. And I'm wondering myself, like once things reopen, am I going to keep going back into the physical office spaces that I used to go to? Or because like, there's so many benefits to not doing it. There's so many benefits to doing it, but there's so many, like the amount of time I save commuting every day, I get to put into like exercise into like cleaning my house into like taking care of my responsibilities. And so just sitting and brainstorming, sitting in my backyard with my girlfriend. There's a million extra little things I can do every week because of that. Um, but going into the physical spaces gives you the opportunity for the kind of serendipity that you and I are having right now, right? Like we, if I hadn't been in that office, I wouldn't have met you and we wouldn't have been having this conversation. So I wonder like how much people are going to want to, are going to want to go back to living the way they had in let's say January or February. Well, I think, I, I don't know. I might be dating this podcast recording here by the time it comes out. But the last weekend at Trinity Bellwoods basically says it uh, all. Yeah. There was, there was 10,000 people at Trinity Bellwoods, yeah. all like 20 year olds. Um, Marissa and I actually dro drove by it because I went to go see my brother down by the lake. Like, um, okay. He lives yeah. by the CN Tower. So then we were driving back and we, we drove by Trinity and we saw so many people look like Coachella. I was like, which every summer it does. And it's amazing. 
And I think 20, like people in their early, late 20s, maybe even early 30s, they're just over it. They're over social distancing. They're just like, nah, weather's great. I'm going outside. I'm sunbathing. I don't give a shit. I'm talking to these people. My friends are coming over. They yeah. don't care. Like, I think, I think the new normal will be like more on like maybe the work side because, because like, okay, maybe, maybe I, I'm, no, this is just a prediction because like you still want to hang out physically with your friends. You still want to have these events, like the science everywhere events. Like you need to have yeah. these freestyle social and you want to have these social events. Like physically, yeah. you want to go to parties. You want to be able to do that. And not everyone's going to get a VR headset to meet in the fucking virtual space. But yeah. Like I have a few friends that do have it and you know, for the last two months, it has been awesome because in Canada, it's been super cold. So I didn't want to go outside. It was like raining and snowing up until like a few <laughs> yeah. weeks ago. So the weather maybe cooperated with COVID to like, stay the fucking side. Canadian. Uh, yeah. You don't want to get this shit. So then we were meeting up in VR and it was, it actually was awesome. But would I rather meet with them in person? Yeah, of course. So there's a fine line. But then with work, um, we were doing mostly remote. Remember when we were at Transmedia's and we only came in, my team only really came in when we had big meetings. I didn't come in every day to work. So I'm like, why would I travel for two hours almost to get there to work where I can just sit at my desk? I have an awesome workspace from home and I can just get to work and spend an extra hour thinking and pondering before starting the work day. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting thought. I mean, I think you probably make a good argument. Like people dividing it up into like work life and, and, and social life is probably a distinction that people will make. Um, like at Trinity Bellwoods, it wasn't like a bunch of meetings, right? Like people weren't coming in until I saw yeah. folks from the office to be like, fuck it, man, I got to get this meeting done. Um, <laughs> but they were, um, they were, yeah, for social interaction, it's really hard to replace that like in-person feeling. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe, um, people will continue to gather for social and then they'll probably... Like the other thing I wonder about is do we think that like office space rental, like that market will change? I, I think so. Yeah. You think it'll drop off? I definitely, I a hundred percent, man. Well, look at Shopify, man. They had like two of the biggest um, commercial real estate spaces for startups and technology companies in Toronto. And they're going fully remote now. I don't know if you saw the, the news, but they literally just said they're going fully remote starting well, like last week. And I, I heard some people, well, I actually saw some tweets from people who work at Shopify and they said that they went to the office to pick up all their things for the very last time. Like this is the last time I was going to go in the office for the foreseeable future. So I think commercial real estate will be more of these like, um, okay, this is actually what I think. This is, this is going to be fucking cool because this is what I, I hope happens. I hope people work remotely. They can work from home. But what will happen is people, um, either individuals or their companies will rent office spaces the same way that we did with the transmedia zone, these kind of flex, flexible office space is not very like rigid. This is our office. It's like, here's a workspace. If you need a workspace and, and like you only have a one bedroom apartment and you and your significant other, like can't share that one space or something, or you're just like, Hey, I need to find a workspace. Cause I like to just leave my home. And then you have this opportunity for serendipity because now I can hang out with my friends who work at Shopify, who work at E1, who work at these other agencies, and I could be doing my work, they could be doing their work, but then we can have this chance for serendipity and talk and hang out. Yeah, I actually think that that's probably correct. Um, yeah, it seems like this virus has, in many ways, propelled us even faster into the future. Man, it really has. All, that's all it did. It, it, everything that was inevitable, it just made it come faster. Yeah. Like even, I mean, you, I've spoken many times at length about the idea of like a universal basic income. And like even that is in some form becoming a reality, right? Like everybody gets, if you were working and you're, you can't anymore, the government's giving you 2000 bucks a month, which, which I think is maybe too much. But um, You think it's too much? I think maybe a thousand is the right number, but I don't know. I, I, that's, I don't know. Yeah. People in the U S only got a thousand dollars once, whereas Canadians got $2,000 four times. Yeah. Yeah. So we got 8,000 versus a thousand. It's crazy. So what are your, what are your thoughts around that? Actually, I really want to pause here and, and really, really, yeah. go I know you, you have very strong feelings and we've talked about universal basic income. Before. Well, I think that it solves multiple crises. It doesn't solve them, but it ameliorates them. It makes them all better simultaneously. Four of them, I think. So there's four crises I think we're facing. Number one is obviously climate crisis. People are pretty concerned about the way we're changing the planet. Number two, economic crisis. Um, I think that 
<clears throat> two things are true of capitalism. Number one, most effective system we've ever had for producing a lot of goods and wealth for a lot of people. Number two, it tends to concentrate wealth in fewer and fewer hands across time. Both of those things are true at the same time. Very true. And we don't have a good strategy for addressing the second part, like a shitty part of capitalism. Right. It's all the money's going to Jeff Bezos. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's tied to the third crisis, which is in some part the automation crisis, right? That you can automate more and more. And that means there are going to be fewer and fewer hands collecting more and more of the wealth. Um, and that contributes to the fourth crisis, which I, I call the meaning crisis. Um, I think that, okay, opioid epidemic, um, rates of depression, rates of anxiety, the highest they've ever been, rates of obesity, debt, highest they've ever been. Um, I think that's because we, don't, we are feeling a, like an existential meaning crisis and we don't know how to deal with it. We need to have a sense of meaning. Um, in our lives to, to propel us through our lives. And when you don't have that, like I worked on a suicide hotline for like seven years. So the people that I was talking to on that hotline, they didn't feel a sense of meaning. They didn't know why they were doing what they were doing. They didn't see how they could contribute to the world around them in a positive way at all. And so they thought, well, why be here? And I think a lot of people are struggling with that in different ways. Um, so like, let's imagine that you've got a job and let's say it's a pretty good job. Um, and it pays you a living that you can, you can live on, um, but you're in a company where you kind of hate it and you're like, I don't really like doing this. Um, and, but you know, I can't, I don't want to leave it because I got like kids, I got a wife, I got responsibilities, or I got a husband, I got responsibilities. And so you're like, well, I don't see, I don't feel like I'm using my skills or abilities that are unique to me, but it gets the job done and I'll just sit through it and I can go home and have a beer and drink when I'm sad about that. Um, that's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is there are lots of people in companies where they're like, I don't feel like I'm using my gifts in this job. And also the company that I'm helping, I can see how it's actively making things worse for the world around. Like it's, it's one of those, let's, I don't know, is it like a, an Exxon Mobil? I, I don't know. You can pick your example. Like everybody will have their own example. Yeah. I'm working for this company and we're destroying the world. Like it isn't even exactly. worth it. Yeah. And so you're like, fuck, I really don't want to be doing this, but what choice do I have? I've got the kids, I've got the house, I got the responsibilities. So I have to keep doing this thing that I don't want to do. Um, I think giving everybody a thousand dollars a month gives people the freedom to make more choices. Um, I think of it as supercharging capitalism. You nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. And it, it, whatever the, the amount is, it could be a thousand, it could be 2000, but it needs to be relative to the economic situation of yeah. the area, right? Like it depends on the, like, what is rent prices? What, what, what do you need to survive? But the thing is too, I had like this thought, it's like, should you just give people that money? And I think it should be at least $2,000 because a thousand is like, yeah, maybe it doesn't even cover the rent. Who knows? I think at 2000, 2500 minimum, something like that. But what I think it should be is it, you said it gives people um, choice. choice. Exactly. 1,000%. Yeah. So now what they can do is they can take, some, take a couple months off to like really think or start working on something that really gives them the passion, that gives them meaning. And maybe that, exactly. that is a side business. Maybe it's a business that ends up making them $2,000 a month. Maybe at that point when you know, they get that income of $2,000 a month, it's obviously reported to the CRA, to the RRS. They're like, okay, um, we can cancel your universal basic income now. Like you've reached that threshold and you can continue doing your thing and then they'll grow that. That, that 2000 a month can become like 10000 a month, 20000 a month. It could, be, exactly. uh, it could be limitless because, exactly. again, in capitalism, it's just ever, ever ending growth, right? So yep. ideally, in the ideal world. Well, I think so. I mean, so there's, I think, yeah, giving people the money, it supercharges entrepreneurship too, because there yes. are lots of people who like, there are two kinds of traps people fall into economically. The first is the one I already described where like they're working at a job that they hate and is making things worse, but they're like, I can't get out of this because I can't make new choices. Second is um, people who do take on work that they really love work that is exciting for them. And they feel like they're using their skills to make the world better. Um, but those people tend to be chronically economically um, deprived. Like they're, they're screwed economically. If you, most people feel like you can't do a job that is meaningful and make money. And I think if you give $1,000 a week to people, then they can start to, I don't think everybody transitions at once. And I don't think it would even be a good idea for everyone to transition at once. I think it should be gradual because we have to, like if we all do it at once, the world kind of falls apart. 
That's true. I mean, it technically didn't all happen at once, but I mean, a lot of people in Canada and the US, they did transition that really quickly over the last gonna, couple of months. And, and it worked out, right? it seemed. It seemed to be okay. It was definitely a stimulus to the economy. Uh, I would say, like, we're looking at an economic depression. Um, you think it's going that, going that way? Several of the reports that I've seen have suggested that um, because, like, many kinds of commerce have stopped. Many small businesses are going out of business because they can't support themselves under these circumstances. Yeah. Um, it's not directly tied to the, like, the, something like a UBI. Um, obviously, it's closer, it's more tightly linked with the, the virus, but yes, I, I think that if we gave a lot of people a lot of money, a lot of people would stop working at the jobs they hated, or at least if you, that's part of why I think a thousand is the right number instead of 2,500. A month? Because, yeah. Yeah, okay. Because I think that um, for a thousand a month, if you live in Toronto, you're like, all right, that covers rent, um, and maybe that's it. Um, and so I still have to work, but I probably have to work less. And mm -hmm. so now I've got extra time in the week. I'm still, you know, supporting our, our local economy, but I got extra time in the week to start up my own side hustle or spend time volunteering or being with my family, whatever I want to do. Um, and I think you can, I think you can gradually, I don't think you should have a, a cap on who gets the thousand dollars a month, because I think that introduces a lot more complications. Like in the States, it's just everyone gets it. Like it's just everybody. Yeah. No string, everybody. No strings attached. Um, you, the reason for that is like you can see in the States, um, there are people who have stopped working for like six weeks or two months and they're still waiting on their checks because the government has to go through all the, this whole list and figure out like who's supposed to get it, who's not. All, that, like, all those layers of bureaucracy just add more complications and cost more money. And I think it's probably a more efficient system to just give it to everybody. That's exactly what Canada did too, right? It's just like, hey, just get it, go exactly. apply for it, and we'll figure it out later. It was crazily easy. I called and three minutes later, they're like, we're going to mail you a check for $2,000. Dude, I had it connected to my bank account because I paid through like the CRA through my bank account. It just, the next day, it just showed up on my account. I was like, what, where did that yeah, where did this money come from? It was amazing. And I think yeah. we we're both in this great situation where we were doing our work primarily with our own businesses and their yeah. corporation. So we weren't paying ourselves. I know that was a fact with Marissa and I, like we usually will pay ourselves dividends or whatever, or, you know, we weren't at that point. It's a small startup. Yeah. Most of our income came from other freelance work and, and other stuff. So yeah. if we pause that, great. Yeah, we're 100%. We can apply for this because Controverse is not paying us directly. It's a corporation yeah. that's getting paid to the company. So that, like we got really lucky. And I think during this time, like you said, you had all this extra time to like really um, change your, your morning routine, change your work habits. And I think that would have been a little bit more stressful, a little bit harder without this, um, this economic um, support from our government. Yeah. Like it was incredible. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, would have been really, it would have been a really tough time. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a way better entrepreneur because I've got this kind of safety net so I don't have to worry about it. It's been, yeah, it's been amazing. I'm, I'm really grateful to live in Canada. Um, one of my uh, housemates, um, he's from India and he got here in January. And he was talking about the differences in the response that Canada and India have taken to this, this problem. And like, he can't believe what's happening here. Like he's a student and the fact that the government's just like, Hey, look, we just want you to have this money. Just, just go be happy with it. Um, it's an unthinkable thing because it's, n it's, n it's something that would never happen in India the way he describes it. No, um, no, never. So yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. We've got a lot of opportunity. And so, yeah, my goal is to figure out how do we use it as, best we can to make opportunities for other people. That's exactly it. So that's like the finite versus infinite game, right? The finite game is like, I want a monopoly. I want to make all the money. I'm going to dominate this industry. The infinite game is okay. How can I maybe do that? I don't really give a shit, but how can we do very well and also make other people like help other people do really well? Yeah. Exactly. How can you continue this game on? You know, that's almost exactly. like the, the infinite game. It's like not just for us, win, win, but for win. other people. When what you want to get that triple win, right? It's exactly. Like always, always, and that—that's totally it, man. It's. I think it's the only way to actually truly win because you get that fulfillment. You get the the capitalist gains. If like you know, you need that to keep going because you need some kind of like it's almost like a score like the money doesn't really mean anything after a certain amount of money yeah it's just like it's just like a score of like hey how much value am i, am I putting out there how many people exactly. am i helping and this is just keeping count almost you know 
Exactly. I mean, the, the NHL, they play for the Stanley Cup every year. At some point, like, the score doesn't matter, but you use the score as a way to figure out, like, yeah, are we getting better? Are we, like, are we making ourselves better and our communities better by doing this thing? So it's just like a placeholder for, yeah. Totally. And that's what I think, like, Ryerson has been really good at with the, the whole zone network. Yes. Yeah. I, I really hope to see more of these kinds of things spread across Canada. Um, like Toronto is really lucky to have something like the zone network, but I don't think there's a reason that it has to only be here. It should absolutely be across the rest of Canada. Oh yeah. And I think it's, it's finally getting there. I just saw on LinkedIn, like DMZ is opening up DMZ Innisville now. Like why? Oh, Innisville? Right. Yeah, man. Cause they're just like, yeah, like we're all virtual now. It doesn't matter, you know, yeah. where the location is. We're doing DMZ Innisville. I'm like, that's amazing. Like there should be one for every like major city, like in certain areas. Like, just totally. Out. Cause like, people will 100%. need a physical place to go. Like that's exactly it. You need that like social, it's almost like social security, right? It's like yeah. that, that social network that you have of like, okay, other people are going through the same things. They have some of the same problems. They can maybe help, so- help solve some of my problems. I can help, help solve some of their problems. And then yeah. you get this like mutual benefit. It's so cool. Yeah. Like it, it's because it, we're social creatures. We're really losing out on that. Our social networks have become these distant Facebook and Instagram things where yeah. you're following people who don't even know you exist. They're posting pictures on their yacht. They don't give a shit about you. Yeah. Yeah. They're, you're just like another like, all right, you're like another eyeball that adds to their ad revenue. And it says, it feels, yeah, it feels really at odds with what it means to be a human being, which is to connect with each other. James. Yeah. That's like the media. That's like the traditional media industry, right? Like yeah. it's, it's like, it hasn't evolved yet. I mean, some people have like, Oh, we're doing Instagram lives. We're going to talk with our, our fans and stuff, but it's, it really still seems like that broadcast. Like even like yeah. this with, with, with the podcast, it's definitely more of like a broadcast kind of thing, but yeah. that can definitely be one part of this whole transmedia um, experience. Like maybe eventually I'll do like live zoom calls with everyone who listens. Like, Hey, this is just an open zoom call. Come on in, whatever. Like it could be something yeah. to get more community involvement, but dude, you used to work at discovery and like now you kind of have started your own media. Cause again, you can even, like move your head to your right. Yeah. Science everywhere, events and media. So it's definitely like you're doing the live events as part of the media, but the media itself is on social. It's on um, other types of like actual media. But how does that differ from like what you did um, at Discovery? Because it's huge. It's totally different. You're going from like this huge network to like your own indie like studio almost. Well, it's it's really different. I mean, Discovery Channel was in like 80 million homes. Um, So we reached a lot of people. But um, it's all one-way conversation. I'm just talking at a camera. I'm hoping that everybody on the other end is getting something out of it. And, you know, often people did, but uh, there's lots of times they didn't. And it's really, hard to, it's really hard to know how to refine what I'm doing dynamically because I have zero feedback. And that's the thing that I'm really grateful for when it comes to Science Everywhere is that it's so much more embedded in communities. Like the, the Freestyle Social live event, we're literally in, like, we're at Bathurst and Dundas with a bunch of people who live in the area getting to talk about this stuff and see where they connect with it and, like, make it personal to them so that I can see that you care about, I don't know, you've got a grandfather with Parkinson's, so I can make sure that we're talking about something that's in that space because it's relevant to you. And even in the online kinds of um, strategies we're developing, it's still way more personal. Like, we get to see our participants and have conversations it's not dialogue it's not diatribe it's dialogue totally it's not just you guys talking to the camera like i I definitely could see like a really cool transmedia sort of campaign and experience with what you guys are doing because literally your company name is science everywhere and the idea of transmedia is it's a story that exists everywhere and it's cross-platform where maybe instead of a one story this, I mean, your story always has to be something very specific, which is like your, your, um, your mission, right? And, yep. and for you guys, it's literally... Let's build social tools for better thinking. And that's exactly it. So if you can tell that same story across multiple channels and do that really well on each specific channel and have them all cross-pollinate, I think you have a winner, man. Because like, that's where media is moving. People want to be able to 
um, like you said, have a dialogue with the people who are telling them their information. They want to be able to build a community with other like-minded people. So, you know, if you were to like live stream to Twitch, but then aggregate like Instagram comments from the lives, Facebook comments, and all of that kind of dialogue that happens off camera and feed that into the show and really, you know, bring that up to the audience. I think that's, man, I think that's the way, I think that's the way the future for media companies as a whole. If you can like somehow find the best parts of specific platforms that you can use just all that is, like you said, it's just your network to broadcast your ideas. And then if you can have those people bring it back in, they, they can start bringing their own ideas and then you can start building it up to a way that you would never even think. And it can live on well, well beyond you, right? That'd be the idea. That's an exciting reason. That's an exciting idea to me for reasons that'll seem like weird at first, but I think that that's actually how we build wisdom as a society. I think it's conversation. And so like the more conversations you can have, I think the wiser we become, which is really important right now because we're at a point where we become smarter faster than we become wiser. That our technology starts, like the capacity of our technology starts to outpace our wisdom to wield it. Um, And so we got to figure out how we build a lot of wisdom quickly. And I think just more and more conversation um, is probably the way to do it. I, I think so, man, because it's going to come from the type of content you put out onto social media and like all these networks, because what all we're seeing right now is the emergence of old media coming on to new media, which is like, you know, you're still getting your CNN, your CBS, your Fox News, putting out bullshit garbage news on all, all over the internet. People are liking it. It's outrage. They know how to fucking game the system to get the most likes and outrage. Those yeah. all get shared and it spreads. And we're getting literally, man, speaking of, of Elon Musk, like he, he said on, on Joe Rogan, he's like, yeah, like we should be afraid of the virus, but I think we should be more afraid of this mind virus. And you know exactly what I'm talking At first, Joe was like, what do you mean? Like there's a virus to the mind? Like, yeah, like mind virus, like literally uh, like dangerous ideas being spread. Yeah. And it blew my mind. I was almost like scared because I'm like, this guy was just talking about his, his latest venture, Neuralink. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then he's talking about a mind virus. I'm like, what happens if you do get a computer virus through these fucking Neuralinks and then everyone does yeah. have literal mind viruses and like, dude, just fries your brain. Whatever. That's, that's this whole sci-fi. No, but, I mean, you're right. Yeah. We, we got to figure out how to, like the way out of mind viruses is wisdom. You got to figure out how to iteratively find your frame, break it, get a better frame. That process, just do it as many times as you can. Dude, and that's exactly... Man, it's like the first time it happens, it's like literally like a mind blown. Like I I remember... Have you ever had that moment? Like there's obviously a moment where we're kids, we don't know too much. What was your like moment of awakening? What was that moment for you when you're like, oh shit? It would have been when I was working at the Ontario Science Center. Um, It'll surprise a lot of people to know that I did not always love science. I was not always a science guy. Um, Not in high school. To a degree, not even in the university. It wasn't until I started working at the Science Center that I, I really, that something changed for me. And it was, it was one day, I was in um, this area called the Science Arcade. Um, and it was early in the morning, so like almost nobody was in the Science Center. It was just me and this other colleague of mine. And this guy was kind of a troublemaker. He liked to, um, like he liked to break rules a lot. Um, he actually writes movies now. He wrote like a movie called The Dirties. Um, anyways. He was standing next to this thing called a plasma ball, which is, if you don't know what it is, it's kind of like a snow, snow globe with like electricity moving around inside of it. Um, and if you put your hand on it, the electricity goes to your hand. It's, it's, cool. it's pretty cool. Um, but I'd seen it, to me at that time, it was not cool because I'd seen it about a thousand times and I was bored out of my mind with it. I, I felt like I'd seen everything it could do. Um, and so this guy's calling me over to it with that like expression on his face, like I'm going to break a rule. So I'm excited. I'm like, all right, what rule are we going to break? This is going to be fun. But like, I didn't know what it could be. Um, and he's dangling like a set of keys in his hands. He puts it on the plasma ball. And then he takes a quarter out of his pocket. He touches the keys with the quarter. And I see electricity shooting between the keys and the quarter. Like coming out of this plasma ball, shooting between them, going into his hand. He's just smiling. At my face is like, I'm like, what is going on here? Like, I feel like I'm watching Zeus. And this guy's just like laughing. He takes a piece of paper, puts it in the electricity, and the thing catches fire. And I was like, man, like, I have seen this thing a thousand times, and I'd never seen it do that before. And I thought to myself, like, what else? I looked around the science center, and I was like, what else am I missing? Like, if I can look at things the right way, what else would I be missing? What else could I see? What else could 
I do. And, and that day, I remember thinking like, oh, man, I, I walked through the rest of the Science Center just figuring out how I could break everything else in cool ways that would let me do more awesome stuff. That's when I really fell in love with science as a process. Dude, like you just saw the Matrix for the first time. That guy yes. just oh, that guy sliced open reality for you. Yep. And man, that's fucking crazy. Because then you're like, then you made the connection of okay, if that happened, what else could I do? Exactly. Because exactly. now your your guys' thing for the last couple of years. I mean, I think I have a video of it on my on my Instagram. You guys are obsessed with that fire. You guys, your whole shtick <laughs> is light. Let's light this guy's arm on fire. Like it's yeah. there's something about it, like, like tribalness of like fire. Like holy crap! Like and you have yeah. it completely under control. Like do I trust this guy? Exactly. Like, <laughs> the rawness of the elements. You can like if you understand it, you can hold literally hold the rawness of nature in your hand. Sorry, was this after you studied neuroscience too? Um, this would have been um, during um, a little bit. So like. I started working at the Science Center in 2003, um, and I started my undergrad in like 2004. So it would have been during that period. I don't remember when exactly, but it was sometime while I was still in university. I was working at the Science Center, and I saw this thing. That's crazy, man. That's so cool. Yeah, and and then and then I mean, it's obviously years later that you're like, hey, I should start a business. Like I, I always find like people have that sort of awakening moment. It, that's exactly it. It's like it's not even like knowledge. It's not even like Hey, I'm really smart. It's just like you have this knowledge of like there's something deeper. It's exactly what you said with the with the electricity. And time after time, b- between myself and people that I know that have taken psychedelics, it's exactly the same kind of reaction they have. It's like a whole like a whole new outlook exactly. on life after. Um, yeah, it's an interesting. Pretty cool. Again, it's just a tool. It's just a tool for yeah. it. it. You again, you have to treat it um, like it, as a, like a tool, not a toy, right? Yeah. And there's a lot, like, VR also made me have that same feeling. It's the exact same feeling. But it, it, and I had the exact same thought after. So you have to treat this like a tool, not a toy, because yep. it, it's super powerful. But some people just really don't understand um, how powerful some of this stuff really is. I'm really curious to see how VR develops because um, I think there are very few people who have had that insight, who don't just see it as like, all right, well, there's the collection of things we all do, and I'll just do different versions of that. There's very few people who have had insight to see how they can break using VR in really new, cool, and exciting ways. So I think you're probably one of them, to be honest. So curious to see how it develops. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm continually, like you said, just continually developing. Like, I've been taking this time to really try new things. Um, yeah. I started learning um, how to use the Unreal Engine. I, have you seen like the YouTube video that came out that went viral, Unreal Engine 5? No. So they just released um, like a teaser video for Unreal Engine 5. Like you obviously, you know what Unreal is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the video game development platform. And they released the video for the next version that's going to be used to create like PS5 games and the next Xbox games. Okay. And it looks so realistic. The physics in it, the lighting, the, the amount of polygons they can have in a scene, it blew my mind. It's like they're getting closer and closer to like trying to simulate reality yeah like it's gonna look so realistic i got i'll send you the video i'll put the the video in the show notes i'm gonna look it up yeah dude it will blow your mind so i've been learning that because think about this too over the last two months two and a half months all video productions have been shut down like if you're doing movie production if you're doing tv i know it's all gigs canceled yeah yeah it had to be all remote because you're doing a lot of a lot of tv so what people have been doing is you can now do virtual production with Unreal Engine. I, I would imagine, and especially I think you will definitely have this at one point, you'll have this sort of like media production room, which is like, that's where you go. I mean, like, a, like an office, a home office, yeah. but something more. It's like, this is where you'd have your Zoom set up. You'll have a really good microphone. So you sound great. You can do t- TV um, uh, yeah, appearances. Yeah, I think so. And you'll have a green screen. This is where I think it gets crazy. You'll have a green screen and then you'll be able to literally put yourself into virtual environments and you'll be able to do these virtual productions uh, remotely. And people are yeah. already doing that with Unreal, man. Like you can make full movies. I want to see it. I really want to see it now. Dude, this is how The Lion King was made. And I just set it up so I can have my iPad as a virtual camera and I can move it around using augmented reality in my basement. And that tracks just the positioning of the camera in the virtual space. So I could use my iPad as a professional camera in VR. It's wild. It's crazy the things you can do now. Yeah, it's really weird. Um, like we're going to start bending reality pretty soon like life is going to start to feel like you're on mushrooms all the time pretty soon we're definitely already bending reality because your face is right in front of me and That's true. you're not you're not physically in front of me we're already bending reality we're just doing it on a flat surface right now we're just gonna 
make it three dimensional. Yeah. It's going to start to feel, I don't want to sound sacrilegious, but it's going to start to feel godlike at some point. Like you can make realities. Yeah, it is. Man, it is godlike. Um, have you ever heard of or read the book of the four by Scott Galloway? No, not yet. So dude, I'll, I'll send it to you. It's, it's so good. Um, he basically talks about the four largest companies in the world, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Google, Apple, and how each one of those are connected to something like deeper, right? And this is why they're widely used. And he said, you know, Google, Google is basically like God. You can ask, if you, right now, you could pray all you want, but God's not going to give you an answer. You can go on Google and ask anything and there'll be an yeah. answer for it. You could even ask, you know, um, philosophical questions and maybe yeah. someone on, on a discussion board somewhere talked about it or there's a YouTube video about it and you can almost get the answer for that question you had or at least build that wisdom. So like, yeah. man, it, it basically is like God. And I think you're right. I think the, the, the problem will be when the technology makes us humans feel like gods because it's, it's not the truth, right? It's going to pull us further away from the truth because right now, if you have an Amazon Alexa, you can make, Hey Alexa, do whatever for me. Hey Alexa, order me a pizza. And like 30 yeah. minutes later, a pizza will just show up. Well, I think what we have to do as a species is earn the right to wield godlike powers. We have to earn it. It's, why, it's one of the reasons I'm really interested in wisdom. We have to learn how to transform ourselves. One of the other characteristics that seems to be important for wisdom and wise behavior is like a capacity to balance one's own interests and the interests of everyone and everything else. Like that you are no more important, but you're no less important. You're, everything is important. And so... Right now, I think humanity in general still tends to be much more egocentric than wisdom would dictate we ought to be. And so I think if we want to start wielding and creating realities, we have to learn how to dissolve the self in some sense. The only way is psychedelics, I'll tell you right now. The only way that I know that you can do that every single time, not just some of the time, it's not like yoga. Okay, you sit down and meditate for 45 minutes and maybe something will happen, maybe something won't. It's like you take mushrooms and I know in 45 minutes what is going to happen. There is no question. You know, like it's, it's, it just, it makes total sense to me, especially for people who could never achieve that themselves. There are monks who could achieve that over 70, 80 years, but how do you teach that to like a 16 year old who is going through this transformation of becoming an adult or an 18 year old becoming an adult? Well, that's one of the things that I wonder is, so let's say that I'm a monk who's gone through meditation for, for 30 years and I've achieved a dissolution of a sense of self. Is that experientially um, identical to just taking magic mushrooms? Sure, the self dissolve, but you, you might argue that the monk has developed something far more powerful than what the person who just took a drug got. Yes. Which is... I, I would argue you developed your capacity to take action in the world, right? Like the monk did it, but it also, they also built discipline. Yes. The person taking mushrooms has no discipline. That is, man, that is a really good point. I think, do you think discipline is a big part of wisdom as well? I think so. Yeah. At the moment, I think wisdom is comprised of like the practice of five values iteratively. They're curiosity, collaboration, calm, creativity, courage. I think if you iteratively practice those five things, it is synonymous with practicing wisdom. How would you practice any one of those? Yeah. So I hope what we're building as a company, Science Everywhere, I hope that's what we're building is tools to help people practice those five things. So have you broken those down or like, hey, we're going to have a game or a task or something or like an app or something specifically for curiosity, which could just be like a stream of random stuff that's like, like checking the news. Like I'm curious to see what's going on in this specific industry. Twitter could do that for you, or it could just be random cat memes, right? I, I think curiosity is something a bit more specific than that. So like my hope, and this is what my PhD is exploring. My hope is that freestyle socials are a tool that helps people build wisdom. And I'm, I'm literally measuring that. Like there are a number of different tools that people have built to try to measure wisdom. None of them will be perfect, but they're all better than nothing. And so they can help us get a sense of like, are we on the right track? Um, I'm going to have people go through freestyle socials and I'm going to see if their wisdom scores on all these different batteries actually go up compared to controls who didn't use freestyle social. Um, so yeah, like curiosity, I think is something like intellectual humility. It's the recognition that you are, I know less than 1% of what's on Wikipedia and so do you. And so does everybody else. Like no, no one person can know enough to be effective in the world. Um, and so recognizing that, like 
very often we speak with a sense of certainty that does not recognize how little we know. So yeah, like I think freestyle socials encourage us to like listen to perspectives that aren't ours. That's part of collaboration, the second C. And like to come back to the discipline, I think that's the last C, courage. Anything that you want to do in the world or anytime you want to take an action to improve things in the world, it's going to take some courage. It's going to take some discipline. It's because often the hard, the things that are most valuable to do are very hard to do. And to make yourself do hard things, you require discipline. That is, man, that's key. That is it right there. That is 100% the essence of not even just com- this conversation, but I think that's the essence of the entrepreneurial spirit of practicing science. And like you say, becoming wise. Like yeah. it, that makes sense. You need to have discipline in it. There's actually, I'll send you a YouTube video called Monk Like Discipline from oh, this cool. guy, this guy, Sam Ovens. I think I told you about him before. Maybe, probably. Consulting.com, of course. Okay. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So if you look up on YouTube, I'll put in the show notes. I'll send you the link. It's uh, called Monk Like okay. Discipline. I've got like looking a number up right of tabs now. that I'm opening up. Okay, yeah. nice. Well, I'll put Can it I in the show about- notes. Um, okay, dude, it's, it's, um, this video like blew my mind. But he's one of these teachers that is transforming so many people's lives. Like he totally transformed my brother's life. Like, like he went from someone who was selling drugs. Yeah, he, my brother went from someone who was selling drugs, someone who is the most disciplined human being I've ever met in my entire life. And it's all thanks to this guy, Sam Ovitz. Like he, he really distilled all these things that you talked about. The, and I don't think he knew that he was, he was distilling wisdom. He's a very wise dude. And I think he takes all of these things you're talking about, and he puts into this course really well. And even if you don't want to become an, a consultant, if you don't want to become an entrepreneur, even I think going through a course like that will just help you sort of like upgrade your, yeah. your mind in that kind of sense. Exactly. It helps you figure out like in some sense, it's a solution to the meaning crisis, right? It helps you figure out you can use discipline to pursue meaning. Yes. You figure out like, what are the things that are inside you that are gifts that are your opportunities that you can bring to the world. And then you need discipline to be able to, to polish off those skills and present them to the world. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm really grateful for like the way that I was brought up because my parents really uh, instilled discipline in, in myself and my brother, like really well. And at first, you know, when you're young, you hate it. Yeah. <laughs> when you're young, you really hate it. But then, you, you know, and I think for me, my discipline um, was amplified when I found meaning and that was w- within art. Um, so when I was in high school, I started taking art classes and I started, um, creating like large pieces of artwork, like just like, you know, paintings and large drawings and stuff like that. And this was the first time that I'd ever gone deep into like one thing. And I would literally work on it from like the moment I got home on a, f- on Friday at like 3 PM until Sunday at like 3 a.m., literally not sleeping for the entire weekend because I had to get this project done and I would just work and I would just like focus on it. And it was through that discipline that I can take that into other areas. So what I'm trying to wonder here is like, well, what I'm trying to ponder anyways, it's like when you're, when you're bringing in these, these disciplines through freestyle social, through these other things you guys are doing, how do you almost ensure that it sticks with them so that they can bring that into other areas of their life? It's a really good question. Um, I think the answer, the short answer is that it won't um, if you go just once. If I learn to ride a bike when I'm five and I never ride it again until I'm 80, I'm gonna be shit at riding that bike when I'm 80. <laughs> like you've gotta, you've gotta practice, you know? Like any skill you don't use, you lose. So I think practicing, um, those kinds of things repeatedly is, is really where is really an important part of um, polishing up the gifts that you have to offer the world. So what, what are the kind of things that you're doing right now to, to practice these things? Like, do you have like, do you have a practice, like not just like through the business, but do you have like certain practices that you do like certain games or like experiences? Do you have like a meditation discipline? Like what are these tools that you do? Well, like I said, every day I, I, my regimen is I wake up at seven 30. I clean something. I, I look around my, house or apartment to find something that I can put in order and clean. Um, and I'll do my accounting. So I'm like, I'm getting all my, like, I'm trying to really polish up my, like uh, my accounting books so that I might, I'm good financial shape. Um, then I will write on my gratitude every bo- every morning. I will exercise, I will meditate, and then I plan out my day. And I do that every day. And man, I got to tell you, I don't want to do it. Um, especially the, the exercise part. Like I dread that part every day, but 
that's part of the routine is learning how to like feel that discomfort, that fear, that whatever, that like all the, the stories you tell yourself in your head and learning, oh, that doesn't matter. You can do it. Um, so that's my practice. Dude, that is, that's awesome. I think like more people who can follow something similar to that, um, the better it'll be because that's almost identical to my, my daily practice. Um, or I guess my daily regimen, uh, as you can say. One of the things I actually like to do is I'll plan tomorrow today. And that doesn't yeah. mean like in the middle of the day, I'll do it the night before so I don't have to think about it the next day. I just execute on what I had to, yeah. that I wrote down. Like, you're almost like, what you're doing there is you're literally programming your life. You're literally yeah. programming, what are the steps? Like, you have to learn how to program yourself. And I think like, we just kind of had this realization, which is like, you know, we are like these characters inside of a video game almost. And sometimes like you literally have to take control of this character. Like it's a puppet on a strings and your mind is almost yeah. something outside of exactly. it. And sometimes your fucking character doesn't want to cooperate. It's like, yeah. no, I'm not going to work out today. No, I'm not going to wake up with my alarm. Me, dude, dude, during these like the quarantine times and, and the last couple months, I've been having um, trouble waking up in the morning more than anything. Like not whatever time I wake up, I'm, I program my brain so deeply now to like get up. Okay. I'm putting my gym clothes on before it'd be go, going down to the gym. Uh, when mm -hmm. I was at the, we used to live at our, at our condo. Yeah, yeah. And I now know, we moved right by me. I know, dude, we were so close. So it's just really yeah. sucks that we, we just moved, but when we move back in, we'll definitely uh, get some, some yeah. outdoor time together, go to high park and do some shrooms. Yeah. <laughs> just well, kidding, dude. Bellas, yeah. But dude, yeah, Trinity Bell was yeah with everyone. But dude, like, uh, for me, like I, I've had an issue with waking up in the morning on time. Like for me, yeah. it's like oh, I just want to sleep in. But I know the discipline of like pulling my character out of bed and getting into the gym, getting down yeah. to the basement, whatever you need to do to work out, get your blood pumping, have a shower, have a great breakfast, go yeah. meditate, write in your journal, plan your day, and just get to work and do that thing that you need to do to just keep moving, moving forward. Yeah. And it's hard. Like, I'm, I can definitely see how, you know, depression, op opioid usage, all these other things, video game addiction has definitely risen through this time, especially if you're just stuck at home. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, it's, it's a really frightening time for people. Like I was talking about this on a podcast yesterday, actually. Um, the idea was interesting enough that I think it's worth sharing here it was part of what's um, so hard about um, this crisis is that we don't know when it's going to end. So like, I, I mentioned that, like, I, I used to uh, take Kung Fu lessons, like I used to study Kung Fu. And that seems like a non sequitur. But I remember in class when our instructor would be like, all right, we're gonna get down and do push ups. The worst times were always when he said, we're gonna do push ups, but he wouldn't tell us how many we were gonna do. And like, even if it was only 20 push ups, those were the hardest 20 push ups, because you didn't know when it was gonna end. If he said, we're gonna do 50 in your head, you're like, all right, I'm ready, I can do that. But not knowing when this is gonna end is part of what makes this so difficult for people. I, yeah, I mean, I guess all we can do is just, just learn to practice calm in some sense to like, recognize that experience is transitory, um, that no experience will last forever. And that if you're worried that you can't bear it, just keep in mind that you've already been bearing it. So you can bear it. You've already proven that you can bear it because you're in this moment bearing it. Dude, that was so deep that I, we just have to end on that. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I don't want to keep you till it's been over an hour. And that yeah. was, that was amazing because like, that's exactly what I've been trying to think of over the last two months. It was like, not just bearing it, but then how do you thrive? How do you thrive in this? It's like, this is how I am. This is, this is the new, new normal. The day that it happened that we moved from our condo to Marissa's parents and we're like, hey, this, we're just, this is the new normal. You're staying inside. I wasn't thinking, oh, how long is it going to be? How long is this going to last? Is it going to be two weeks? Oh, no, shoot. Now it's four. Now it's three months. Holy shit. Now it's a whole year. I'm just like, this is the new normal. What do I need to do? Well, not much has changed for me because I usually work from home. So I'm used to getting up. Okay, then start working. And luckily, our team at Controverse was already set up for remote. We were ready for it. We just kind of did it. I've been thinking that the future is going to happen anyways. So if it comes quicker, awesome. I, that's how I've been seeing it. Sure, there's going to be a lot of like nasty stuff that happens in the middle. There's always a messy middle. So people are going to die. That, that really sucks. And it's really awful what's happening. But at the end of the day, we're going to get through it and we're going to get to the other side. This is a paradigm shift. And you need to just be like, 
fucking Zen in it. You need to be meditating to practice the discipline of being calm. You have to just do all the other things that you were explaining to just build up wisdom over time. And it doesn't have to be in that order as right. It's just, it, it happens yeah. kind of randomly. Iterative process. Yeah. And it's just iterative and you just keep iterating and just keep going and improving. Even if that means for me, my iteration is, okay, hey, just wake up five minutes earlier, try to get yes. my alarm. Like, you know, just that's good. You should celebrate that. That's awesome. That's exactly because at first I was feeling shitty about it, but then like Marissa said the same thing you did. You should feel better. Like it's oh, you woke up only forty minutes after your alarm, not an yeah, hour. I'm like, yeah, that's progress. That's Good. progress. Uh-huh. So that I think we can measure that in so many other things in the world right now. Like there's lots of progress happening, and I'm gonna end this honestly um, with a book yeah. recommendation for you. I'm gonna send it to you. I'll put it in the show notes. It's called The Future Is Faster Than You Think, okay. and it was written by uh, Peter Diamandis and uh, Stephen Kotler. And oh, he's the founder of uh, Singularity. You? Hell yeah, man! Yeah, yeah dude, you got to read their book. It's incredible. They, they talk about how literally, like, we think we're living in the future now. Just wait five, ten years now, and I think yeah. it's gonna be five years now. Like, like the the rate of acceleration has just spun out of control right now. It's gonna be unrecognizable. It's gonna yeah. be unrecognizable. We will have flying cars. We will have all these things that we've been promised for the future, and I'm so excited for that, man. But I think part of that future is not just getting this technology, it's figuring out how to use it properly. And I think we only just scratch the surface of that, of how do you, how do you actually control this stuff? And it's through wisdom. I think it's, it's really the only way. And you can't just buy these things. You can't just like give it away. And I think even if that is the case, because that's how rea- reality is going, you can just go buy a fucking teleportation machine <laughs> and <laughs> have your thoughts scattered across the internet for everyone to listen to. We need to teach people how to use it properly. So I, I, I'm trying to find more ways to do that for myself and hopefully listeners of this podcast and, and, and people out there will start figuring this stuff out. I can't wait to read that book. Dude. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So we'll end it on here. Cause it's been over an hour, but man, just thank you so much for coming on this podcast. Like your insights are so fucking awesome that I think we're gonna have to do a part two. Cause we just, we just scratched yeah. the surface here, man. There's a lot to cover. Yeah. Appreciate it. I mean, it's a lot easier nowadays to just, kind of turn on the zoom and, and do a podcast. Yeah. I mean, I'm, where am I going to, I'm here. I, I can, yeah. Be here. I think it's the only way to simulate that, uh, that serendipity that we talked about that we had in the office. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Anthony. This was fantastic. 